طيب بوكس هاي هلو Can't unmute yourself. Uh, hmm. Are you on? Uh, are you on the Linux client by chance, Adam? I think you can't unmute on Linux. I think that's a Zoom bug, actually. I'm not sure there's anything we can do about that on our side. We hit this, uh, another presenter was on Linux and we had to, I don't know, they were unable to talk. It's uh, unfortunate. Cool, cool. Hey, Daniel. Well, I'm able to unmute. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I'm uh, joining from Microsoft Office. Wow, look at that. It's beautiful. <laughs> On site today. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm joining from uh, my backyard office. <laughs> That's much more beautiful, I have to say. It is, it is okay. It is, it is all right. <laughs> you don't get bears there? Looks wood like behind it. Uh, no bears. Uh, it's, it's very residential, um, but there's just some, some trees in between the properties here. So, it so looks... maybe raccoons. <laughs> uh, probably. Yeah, for sure. There's coyotes and, um, Like, yeah, large. There's actually a fox now and then that runs around the neighborhood. Surprisingly, we have a lot of foxes in Berlin. Interesting. And there was even one that got famous because it's still uh, from one neighborhood. Um, they all lost their sleepers that they left outside uh, their house. And a lot of people um, have crocs. So they found a stash at the... Uh, Fox House, I don't know how it's called, <laughs> um, of like more than a hundred pairs of uh, Crocs. Wow, that's that's hilarious. You can bring it. It's uh, there are pictures even. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, I think there's Sorry. still no luck there. Sorry, I meant to say <clears throat> Adam, are you uh are you unmutable? Are you better? Unmutable. Working on it. Got it. No worries. <clears throat> I think you have to log into Zoom as well, uh, in order to connect to this meeting. You don't need like a real account. I mean, I mean, a, like a paid account, but I think you do have to log in. <clears throat> Aha. Crocs thief. Oh my God. It's <laughs> amazing. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. 
Fantastic. Right. So, okay, no problem there. I can hear you too. Yeah, can you hear us? Maybe. Is it okay now? Can you hear me? Is it fine? It is okay. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so, um, welcome to Tag Runtime uh, meeting today, July 18th. Uh, today, we're talking about uh, having uh, metal, metal three or metal cubed. Uh, I actually don't know the pronunciation. Metal cubed. Of course, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for, for coming today to present. Um, uh, I put a link in the chat if you haven't signed in to the meeting agenda, just to add yourself in there. Um, uh, Adam, I, I, are you leading the, the talk today? For yes. on, on your side, awesome. Yes, I will. I will do the presentation, and uh, Mohammed will join uh, in with some demo. Cool. Um, I just wanted to say thanks for putting all the detailed information in the agenda. Uh, those are great, great links to have in there for us. Yep. No problem. Um, yeah, so, uh, I don't know, um, I, I can take notes, um, I don't know if you, if you want to, if there's anything else to coordinate, uh, if you want to coordinate, Danielle, um, uh, the, the, um, moderating, I guess, <laughs> um, but I, I, I can run the, I can take notes today and, and so forth, um, yeah. It sounds good, but. I guess we could just uh, go right at it, right? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I I guess uh, I can then start sharing, right? Yeah, sounds great. Please go ahead. Okay. Can you see the uh, PowerPoint window, the presentation? Yeah. Okay, I will just make it full screen. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, sorry for the little technical issue. Uh, so today, uh, Mohamed and me, uh, Adam, will present the MetaCube incubation proposal. Um, we are working for Ericsson Software Technology and uh, we are both uh, maintainers of, of the project. And I will start with some introduction and, and some overview of the project and uh, Mohammed will take over at the end um, for uh, a small uh, demo about the real life use case. And then after that, we can answer any questions you have. So what's the Metal Cube? Uh, metal Cube is a bare metal provisioning uh, solution that's, that is cloud uh, native, uh, especially Kubernetes native, and uh, follows a declarative principle to, to manage the life cycle of both individual uh, bare metal machines and also Kubernetes cluster deployments on top of those machines. And our main components uh, that we are uh, releasing uh, reg and testing regularly are the bare metal operator, the uh, cluster API metal cube provider, and the IP address manager. And uh, we also release and ship a uh, containerized ironic image. And then our project integrates with uh, OpenStack Ironic. That's the bare metal lifecycle manager that uh, can talk to the 
uh, baseboard management controller of the uh, different servers. And uh, we also utilize the IPA, the Ironic Python agent, that's a deployable RAM disk uh, that can uh, enhance the functionality of the Ironic. And uh, in the Kubernetes world, we achieve the multi-cluster management by a cluster API. And uh, basically that's how uh, our uh, default or, or basic stack looks like. Uh, Kubernetes um, abstraction layer is at the top and at the bottom that is the physical hardware. And you can see that uh, we uh, integrate the cluster API. Basically we deploy uh, to an existing cluster or we uh, bootstrap a small ephemeral cluster and and in that cluster uh, there's the cluster API uh, controller and, and other resources and also the matter uh, cube control plane our operators the ironic the the cap m3 and, and the BMO the bare metal operator and the cluster API provider meta cube and from that uh, control cluster, we can manage the life cycle of the physical machines. I listed on the left side, again, the, the basic components and uh, some optional extras. And that, that's the IP address manager that comes handy when someone wants to do a uh, deployment into an environment where there's no DHCP server, for example. And uh, we can do this sort of uh, Kubernetes native uh, IP address management, uh, basically simulate what, what a DHCP server would do, but uh, at the end supplying static IPs to the, to the machines, injecting it via the uh, Ironic. And then we are working on an Ironic standalone operator. That's, that's something new because Ironic is, it wasn't originally developed for, for uh, Kubernetes, uh, rather for OpenStack, uh, it's a bit complicated to, to configure in, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So there's an already an existing alpha project uh, and effort going on to, to make it uh, more uh, easy to use. And then we also have a custom IPixie builder because we support uh, both IPixie uh, and Redfish uh, based booting. Uh, we also support a bunch of different vendor specific uh, BMC protocols uh, and also the standard Redfish and IPMI. And uh, as I said, uh, users can boot via IPXA or Redfish. And there is already a proposal for UEFI boot, uh, HTTP booting that will be a third way of booting uh, machines. And uh, sometimes you have to customize the IPXI firmware. So we, we have a tool for that also. So what, what's the history of the project? Uh, it was established in, in uh, late January 2019. Um, it was accepted into Sandbox uh, by the Tag Runtime community in, in uh, September 8th of 2020. And uh, the first incubation proposal was submitted uh, late last year. And uh, now we have updated our incubation proposal to, to follow the new guidelines. And that was uh, submitted just recently, a few weeks ago. Why do we want to go to incubation with this bare metal lifecycle management project? Uh, in our opinion, there is no incubating bare metal ICM project. So there is no go-to or standard or best practice project in, within the CNCF at the moment. There are projects that uh, work in the same space inside in CNCF, but uh, we want to be the go-to project. We think we are the most mature and most uh, uh, featureful uh, project uh, in, in the CNCF in this specific space. And in order to reach our goal to be the go-to or the best practice project in this space, uh, we need the resources and, and the visibility that an incubating uh, project is provided. And uh, simply we think that we just uh, reach the 
the maturity level where we can fulfill all the incubation requirement, at least based on our self-assessment. And that, that I just highlighted here two points uh, that since we joined the sandbox, there was a continuous growth and the engagement, um, both technical and community-wise. Uh, and also there is a history of, of successful open source adoption and also commercial adoption of the MetaCube stack. And I will show the um, more, more info about that. And uh, yep, that's basically the, the um, reasoning behind why we want to uh, go ahead with this process. Just to highlight some, some um, minor things or not minor things, but <laughs> the major things about the, the growth in the sandbox. This we also highlighted in, in the key talk this year uh, on KubeCon, KubeCon EU, that during the sandbox period, we implemented, the community has implemented uh, over 60 major features and many, many smaller ones. We, we have dedicated release team and released more than 90, uh, 90 releases across those four, four repositories where we conduct releases. Uh, we are nearly, uh, we have nearly 5,000 commits, but it's for sure over 4,500. And that's just what was done in, in, in the sandbox. We gained adopters, maintainers, and uh, the activity can be summed up by, by the fact that we have around 200,000 GitHub events. Uh, uh, that was, that was, uh, that happened in the sandbox based on the dev stack statistics. And then uh, who are the open source adopters? So other open source project that integrate with the MetaCube. That is the, the Airship project. That's uh, also a lifecycle management project, but has a larger scope than MetaCube. Uh, it's, it's about managing a full infrastructure, not just the bare metal lifecycle. Then there is the dust shift that's, that's uh, also uh, similar similar um, project as well as the Canod. Uh, and then there is something different, this Medicates, where uh, that, that project only borrows our remediation controller, but still mentions and, and documents and uses MetaCube uh, features. And there is this uh, Silva um, project, which is uh, basically an open source telco uh, framework and ecosystem that was developed for uh, fulfilling European telecommunication requirements. Uh, and, and that also utilizes the Conod and through that it, it uses the MetaCube. And then the commercial adopters, uh, there is Ericsson and Red Hat. I highlighted them because these two companies provide uh, or were the earliest adopters and they do at the moment the maintenance and the and the most contribution uh, for the project also Ericsson provides uh, part part of the infrastructure for testing uh, but we aim to to transition uh, to fully use CNCF resources but there are some technical challenges in that then uh, there's Fujisu uh, who uh, I have a, also a talk about MetaCube. I link that and, and then they also use it to, to provision uh, bare metal machines, uh, same as, as Deutsche Telekom and IKEA and also Pete's Global Data Recovery Services. Uh, some of these users uh, have um, production systems in a sense that they they uh, serve customers with it some of them just use this internally and then uh, from uh, the last one is, is SUSE uh, MetaCube is officially part of the SUSE Edge uh, solution that SUSE says and I forgot to mention that in case of, of uh, Red Hat MetaCube is part of OpenShift and in case of Ericsson it's, it's also part of the uh, current telco offerings of, of Ericsson so uh, the next topic I think I have to talk about is how, how does our community looks like? Uh, and, and that's basically just a short list of what is available for, for people who are interested in the project. And, and this was mostly uh, created after we joined the sandbox. 
minor things like a mailing list and Slack channel was, was there already. But uh, since then, we, we have a dedicated security process with a security lead, with a security mailing list uh, that is well documented. And we already had the security uh, disclosures. We had uh, 184 uh, community meetings, if I counted it correctly. And we started doing uh, bigger meetups just uh, to plan ahead for the for the future we've done two in the previous two years or actually this year and and the previous year and and these are all recorded we will reach soon 200 uh, recordings on on youtube on our uh, on our uh, youtube channel uh, based on the claw monitor we we have a, a score uh, that has like 90 points and that means that uh, we fulfill almost all the best practices that that uh, that are measured by that uh, measurement and we also gained the open ssf best practice badge and we are on progress to to get the silver but there are still a silver badge but there are still a few minor uh, details that we have to iron out and then we have a large community ci uh, that basically uh, just means that the we, we provide a quite quite large uh, test environment, automated test environment. Um, last time I counted, we were over 100 different type of jobs that run and test the, the code. So uh, the community is focusing on, on quality assurance quite, uh, quite a lot. Um, we have a website and, and a book. Uh, the website might be interested because of the, the blog posts, but, but the main source of truth is, is the book. The, we call it the user guide, and that is being expanded uh, continuously, even just in the uh, current weeks. We have 50 maintainers. This in our, our project means that the people who have approval rights in at least one repository, but there are many among these 15 who, who have approval rights in, in many of the repositories. We have a dedicated security lead who, who is always on, on standby. Uh, and if not, then he has a um, uh, deputy who can uh, jump in. If the security lead is, is not present, we have a release team of uh, five people. I wrote four here, but we have actually five people. And uh, that's what I mentioned that they've done already 90 releases. We have Slack channel, we have a public roadmap, it's a GitHub project. And we, I, I linked uh, among the videos, uh, a few KubeCon videos, but we were also, we are also trying to be present on uh, personally on, on, on each EU and NA KubeCons. And uh, we have been there in the last two years, uh, uh, at, at least uh, from, from, um, what I remember and before that was the Corona time. So uh, I'm not sure about that, but other than that, uh, last year we managed to uh, do a country fest that I think was a, was a success. We always uh, try to get a kiosk and, and talk with uh, all the interested parties there. And, and also uh, we managed to do a lightning talk just recently in the EU KubeCon. And thanks. Uh, for your attention. This was just a quick rundown. And if you if uh, you are okay with that, then we could uh, um, watch the the demo that Mohamed has recorded uh, about a um, and, and yep. I, I think we uh, there is a one, at least one question in the chat and maybe open it up to other questions at this point before the demo. Yeah, yeah, sure. I can answer it before the demo. Right. So I was asking, like, how diverse is um, the uh, contributors? You said that you have about 15. Uh, are they all um, from, how do, how do you pronounce the name again? Metal? Cubed. Cube? Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so so how diverse the the uh, contributor list? Yeah, so the maintainers are are I think uh, mostly from the two two companies that I have highlighted, but the the, the contributors is um, is quite diverse. Um, 
we had contributions and, and ongoing discussions with Orange. That's uh, that's uh, Orange and and, and uh, Deutsche Telekom. Those are uh, telco companies. Uh, we had contribution from from Fujitsu, from Dell, from AT and T, um, from from independent developers, um, uh, all, all the adopters who I listed. They also contributed. We had. Um, uh, Contributors and and presenters uh, from Nvidia and uh, uh, we had interest uh, from people. Uh, actually, we had interest from IBM uh, joining our committee meeting. So we got uh, security requirements. Like uh, during there was some CNCF events where they were checking project security and and we got an issue. Uh, like they created an issue for our project that was pushed by Epic Games. So there are all sorts of um, uh, people and, and organizations, um, at least as far as we can see, who are um, partly contributing and, and, and part of them are, are just uh, using MetaCube and, and sometimes um, just uh, wants to ask for things or... or um, engage with us. This list about the companies that I, I display here is just those who officially uh, uh, declare that they are adopters. We have an adopters file in the, in the community repository, in the project, and, and uh, organizations who are willing to publicly, publicly um, um advertise that they they add themselves to that list and these are the, those companies so that's uh, about how, how this looks like so these are companies that are adopters some of them are contributors and how about maintainers do you have um, maintainers out of uh, metal cube yeah maintainers are are uh, from these two companies mainly, and we have okay. uh, Emeritus Maintainer who is not in maintainer role at the moment, just contributor from SUSE also. So it, it's always changing. We already mm -hmm. went, uh, during the sandbox, just during the sandbox, we already, I think, went through one generation of maintainers. So people who are maintainers today, were not maintainers when the when the when the project joined into the sandbox. I I think there might be two two people or three out of the fifteen. So it's it's uh, changing con constantly, but but so far it it was not an issue. So just just to just to be be explicit about the maintainers, you're saying out of the fifteen, it's split across Ericsson and and Red Hat. At the moment, yes. Yep. Okay. It's it's fifty fifty, so it's it's almost exactly fifty fifty. Yep. Can you go back maybe to the community slide again? Thank you. Um, I was wondering when you were like talking about the security processes, how do you handle embargoed issues? It's it's uh, we had. I think we had this a situation like that. We we have this security, um, uh, not guideline. We don't call it guideline, but but security process documentation. And we have three different categories in the documentation. So things that can be uh, handled publicly, things that can be part partially handled publicly. So the discussion goes behind closed doors, and the the fix goes uh, the like the pull requests that contain the fix go publicly. And, and we have also a completely um, embargoed or, or, or hidden process also documented. Um, and uh, that we had disclosure using that process where the uh, security lead and the fix team, uh, I don't want to go through the whole process, but, but the security lead uh, puts together a fix team uh, we have this security mailing list, and, and we can discuss privately who will be on this, uh, this uh, fixed team. And they together can work on private uh, forks. And at the end, just when some the embargo is lifted and something can be uh, merged, that's the moment when they open it up. But uh, we have done that. 
So, so that, that, and that is uh, documented in our security uh, document. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, well, it's not really related, but uh, you mentioned uh, the release number, but like what's the release cadence uh, approximately? Uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I have to ask for some help because I, I don't uh, really know the meaning of <laughs> this. Oh, so how, the, how the... frequent um, are the releases? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, every time there is a cluster API release, we do a release for almost everything. In the Ironic image, we follow the release process of, so we have an Ironic image repository. That's the fourth repo where we release, we follow the ironic release cycle. So that's at least six, six releases a year, but uh, sometimes more. So that's the minimum. And then uh, the cap entry is released, uh, like the minor releases of cap entry are released when the, the CAPI has uh, new releases and then patch releases are based on like the situation. And uh, the BMO, the bare metal operator is also, well, for that, we just started releasing about a year ago. So I, I can't really talk about like massive history there. Um, but uh, maybe Adil, I, I seen you are also on the call. You are part of the release team. Do you have some, some more up-to-date uh, numbers about this? Yes, I can. I can explain. My name is Mohammad Adil Goffa, and uh, so our main repo, which is Cluster API Metal Cube, for that we actually follow CAPI. Whenever there is a release, Cluster API, we are provider for the Cluster API. So whenever there is a release for the Cluster API, uh, we create release on our side because we have to pump everything, and uh, uh, we mostly follow that. And Cluster API release cycle is a four month release cycle. In four months, they have to do a minor release. Um, when it comes to bare metal, that as uh, Adam mentioned, uh, we recently started doing the release for it. But for that, we also have uh, uh, we decide in the community meetings if there are changes that uh, need to uh, we meet, need to make a minor release, then we do it. There is no, I think I don't think we have a defined cycle for bare metal release, uh, but. Uh, for CAPM3, we have a defined cycle uh, according to cluster API releases. Thank you. It's... Uh, yeah. And we also have this IP address manager, and that also follows the the CAPI. Yes, that also follows CAPI, yes. Yeah, so that's the four. Yeah, thanks, Adil. Yeah, well, along with the, the CAPI uh, releases, is there any consideration that you have to take into account for new Kubernetes versions itself, or is following CAPI enough to qualify for that? As far as I know, so far it was enough. We, of course, we, we closely monitor that and uh, and test it. Um, we have tests for, like already when there is like a pre-release version of new Kubernetes, then, then we start to test that. Um, but, for us, I think the guiding principle is the CAPI because we cannot really use the full stack without the CAPI. But uh, correct me, Adil, if, if I'm wrong. I yes, see. I can explain. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I can explain regarding the Kubernetes. So basically in CAPI, I'm also in the release team of Cluster API, um, leading the release of Cluster API. So in cluster api we have this rule that whenever there is a minor release of kubernetes we, they also do a try to do a patch release or minor release of capi as soon as possible within a week and capm3 we follow capi so whenever the capi does the patch release then we do also do that so we are we accommodate kubernetes as soon as it's released so um does, does, does that 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 Cappy, uh, I'm sorry. Did, did you say minor release or patch release for for Kubernetes that you have to do within a week? Uh, so we do the patch release. We don't follow like the Cappy has its own release cycle, and we don't change our release cycle. Okay, and whenever Kubernetes does the release, we just create a patch release from our latest release that is currently going. Yeah. 
for example, 1.80 minor release is on 12th of August and cluster API release is coming on 13th of August. So we will release Capy on 12th and then we do a batch release 1.8.0 uh, with the new Kubernetes here. Okay. And then in the CapM3 side, we will do uplifts and new, create new batch, yes. And that doesn't mean Metal Cubed immediately takes that every patch release, but at least uh, once a quarter or so. No, no, we cubed. will, uh, for the patch releases, if there is a Kubernetes, then we Metal 3 also take that uh, immediately, yeah. Okay, oh, great. Yes. Uh, I, I also had a couple of quick questions. So first of all, thanks for the presentation to tag around time, uh, Adam. Um, so, so my question was uh, regarding, uh, you mentioned that the current test infrastructure is provided by Ericsson and there is a plan. Is So is there a plan to move to community owned infrastructure? Yeah, so it's part partly provided, no, not uh, all of it. Uh, for example, for the bare metal operator, it's mostly CNCF resources. Uh, not not Ericsson. There is a because the Meta Cube is dealing with um, physical hardware, and we do run a lot of end-to-end -end test workflows, uh, and we actually do it in in a realistic way. So we don't really mock anything when we do do the end-to-end -end testing. We need quite a lot of uh, resources, and in quite specific way to be able to uh, simulate the bare metal behaviors. Uh, so mostly these end-to-end -end tests that are provided uh, by Ericsson, but it's just like an OpenStack uh, cluster is, or, or OpenStack cloud environment is provided and we just do everything ourselves there. Uh, but yeah, there is, there is a plan. Uh, we had a vendor neutrality uh, declaration document, and we highlighted there that uh, where, where, where it is possible, we will move to use only the community resources. And of course, um, there are these uh, special use cases where we cannot uh, move away quickly, but we are thinking on, on uh, solutions. For example, there is an ongoing re request for, towards CNCF to to get these Equinix uh, uh, bare metal resources. Maybe that will be one thing that can, can help us uh, move into the right direction. So there is ongoing work. Got it, got it. Uh, the, the other question I had was um, the, the bare metal cluster API provider, right? Uh, so how how is it different from say other providers of cluster API which live in Kubernetes six organization? Uh, so, yeah, I I think I I got got your question. So as far as I know, there are two other bare metal uh, lifecycle management tool that integrates with the Capi. One is the Tinkerbell, and the other is a Capmas uh, that. Uh, manage bare metal. I, I don't want to like uh, take into this group the the VMware and, and and such stuff. Just that purely manages bare metal. And uh, one very big difference in our project that we support Redfish and different flavors of Redfish. All these other projects, as far as I can tell, only support IPMI and IPXI booting. We support virtual media booting and uh, via the Redfish and the different uh, vendor-specific protocols. Uh, and as I said, we we try to now bring in a third way of, of getting uh, data or, or getting the machines provisioned, this, this UEFI HTTP booting. That's one thing. Then uh, the other stuff uh, is uh, basically uh, our agent. So we have a two-stage uh, provisioning process that's very different for others, especially those who only use uh, IPXE booting. Uh, 
we we provision an agent, this this Ionic Python agent, and that looks like some minor information at first, but this we can uh, like through our declarative API through the BMH, I can show you. So when we select the machine and specify the different protocols, like here it's IPMI, but that would be Redfish or whatever, and and we just declaratively specify these things and and uh, then we have another configuration within the ironic pod uh, that uh, fine tunes the behavior of this agent and this agent can do a lot of things and and we um, expect it to do these things so you, you can you can also clean with, with the meta cube so there is a uh, variable or field that you can use here, for example, for a bare metal host and, and ask the agent to clean a machine. There are uh, ways to do firmware updates for, for the machines, BIOS updates, there is a rate configuration that you can do from this declarative Kubernetes uh, uh, layer. And, and that's because we have the, that agent that can do like sort of pre-configuration of, of these machines before it would write or after it has written the actual disk image uh, to the machines. And I think that's, that's one big difference that we have this agent that can do maintenance and cleaning and configuration and, and all these things. So because of that, we have a kind of a wider set of, of tools than, than other projects that only use IPixi booting and 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 uh, no no not this two two stage uh, process with the agent and also we are um, completely um, distro independent so whatever you deploy you you don't need uh, any um, um, you, you don't have any how to say like restrictions. So if you want to deploy a Windows image, you deploy that. If you want to deploy a BSD image for whatever reason, you deploy that. If you want any Linux distros to deploy that, you don't have to put any MetaCube specific thing into your into your um, disk image that will land on the machine. Uh, we do this uh, in a way that that. Uh, uh, we, we are not not relying on any specific Linux distro or, or whatever. So that's that's why we have this agent. That that is one other um, key feature of this two-stage provisioning process. That the agent can handle all, all the nitty-gritty stuff, and and then your your uh, or the user's uh, uh, image that that's being installed or deployed on these machines is is intact. So yeah, these. Are uh, these are the key key differences. I probably forgot some other stuff, uh, but these are quite uh, like uh, key things that that are different for us. Got it. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Uh, and a, and a related quick question to this is: uh, Have you considered putting the cluster API provider for Metal Three in uh, um, in the Kubernetes Six organization? like donating it to Kubernetes community. Um, because uh, the way I see it is there is Kubernetes 6 org and cluster API and all the providers of cluster API uh, live there, right? So have you considered the MetalCube one also to be donated over there? There, there have been considerations uh, main, uh, since I'm, I'm working on the project that was mainly because of testing. We, we were thinking that maybe the meta, the cap, cap M3 could be tested um, together with, with the other uh, uh, providers. But then because how we deal with the, the hardware and, and uh, how we use our IP address manager we decided against it, and we also, I think, haven't seen um, how to say like like any any problem uh, or, or any any negative effect uh, uh, that that would arise from the fact that we are not part of the or or our or our provider is is not in, in the uh, in the Capi uh, repository. So 
it's yeah. it's something that might we might end up with in the future. It's it's not I, I wouldn't rule it out, but right now because of our project specific needs, as I said, uh, because how how we test the how how we test the CAPM3 and how we utilize uh, the bare metal uh, workflow or the bare metal machines. We, we are not, not uh, uh, yet ready for that. So ju just as a follow on there, um, you know, as, as Raja said, the, the SIGs for cluster API a repo allows you to be plugged into things like the cluster cuddle command line so that end users can generate a uh, cluster API template and definitions up front. It doesn't mean that your provider code has to be hosted in the SIGs repo. You can still develop completely independently and do all the things you're saying, um, but it, it does bubble it up in, into the SIG as a, a official supported method. And I, I would say, especially for cloud providers along the way, like everything is very specific to the provider. So I think your model should fit in there as well to be uh, like a cloud provider is very specific, right? It's not generally applicable anywhere else. So a bare metal provider should also fit in, um, but does allow you to to be part of that that community and in the command line uh, for end users to deploy uh, in the standard way. Something to think about. That that one that one we have. I I just thought about the uh, like um, our whole. Uh, controller being in the, in there, but that sort of integration and others correct me if I'm wrong, but that sort of integration we have, and we are also listed as one of the official providers in the CAPI documentation. Gotcha. Okay. I, I hadn't checked that myself yet. Very cool. D does that address what you were talking about Rajas or, or are you looking at for something else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that 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 does. But um, I kind of agree with your point as well, Stephen. That you know this can be like a standard way to uh, you know provide all the providers, and then you can controller can live somewhere else, and you know how the cloud providers also do it. So yeah, I mean this is another perspective for you, Adam, uh, to just ponder about. Yep. I think we're good uh -huh. to the. Demo, I guess I'm good with my questions. I had I had one other question, just uh, related to other providers. Um, I think uh, we might have mentioned uh, mentioned Tinkerbell at one point. Is there commonality at all across between Metal Cubed and Tinkerbell, or an opportunity to collaborate on certain parts? Does that make sense in any way? I, uh, as far as I know, no. I mean, we we built the stack on top of the basically the like the the core of of the thing is 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 the BMO and bare metal operator and the ironic and I don't think Tinkerbell uses uh, ironic as far mm -hmm. as I know so our how to say like DNA our our uh, state machines and and the way of operation originates from from that that logic. So we are very different in that sense. We are also very different from the mass. So I I I don't don't think there is that much commonality between the project. I mean, they they work in the same uh, problem space, but how they do it, as far as I understand, is very different. And and you you see room uh, and differentiation there to have. Uh, these multiple projects existing in, in the landscape. There's enough differentiation there, um, not just your implementation, but really the use cases as well. Well, that now nah, nah, that is like um, I, yeah, I, 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 probably a, a hard question, but just, just just wanted to ask and get get your opinion. As as like as far as I, I get it. Um, we can do more, and we can do all what what the the Tinkerbell can do, as far as I understand. So I I, I don't know like, like the way you ask that that uh, is is there place for both to exist? Um, is there something that we can't do that the Tinkerbell can? Uh, I don't think that is such a thing from bare metal lifecycle management perspective. 
but this is just my experience. Um, okay. Yep. That that's fair, man. Um, right. Yeah. Why don't we move move to the demo? Thank you for answering all the questions. Yeah. Thanks. Let me just share my screen. Yeah, I will stop sharing. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yep. yep. All good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So here I have a, a, a quick demo and it's it's recorded so that can help also skip some of the part that takes time like the provisioning uh, instead of just sit and wait for that uh, the demo is uh, basically just demonstrate one of the basic features on metalcube and uh, the use case for this uh, feature that it, can have like multiple uh, use cases. Uh, the idea here is just to uh, swap uh, a node from a bare metal host to uh, another bare metal host. And that can be uh, for the use case of maintaining a node or uh, also upgrading the bare metal host or uh, for any uh, target uh, features on the uh, new, new bare metal host. Uh, here, I already have a provisioned uh, cluster. Uh, as you can see. So on the top terminal, I'll just uh, communicate with Metalcube through uh, kubectl. And uh, uh, next to that, we have like the cluster provision. Basically, I'm using a kind uh, cluster as an ephemeral cluster for the management, where we have all the control plane uh, running there. And uh, we got uh, this bare metal or target cluster provisioned with uh, uh, three replicas of the uh, KCP here. Uh, I didn't proceed with uh, uh, installing the CNI, so the uh, nodes are not ready, but we don't need that. Basically, the idea here is just to demonstrate how uh, Metalcube can uh, swap one of the running machine from a uh, bare metal host to a bare metal host. Here I have uh, the uh, machine uh, running, the copy machines. Uh, yeah, uh, we have three that are linked to the uh, control plane and this one is the worker. I didn't show uh, which ones are the uh, KCP here. We can see that from uh, the label on the machine itself, but for this demo, I can tell this is the uh, worker and the others are part of the control plane. And on the bottom, we have the bare metal hosts here. We have already four VMH provisioned and I will add a new one. Uh, during the demo, we can easily also link the uh, machines to the bare metal host. Uh, here from the provider ID or using the, the node, uh, node name uh, from here. So uh, the first thing uh, here, I'm just applying a new uh, bare metal host named node4 with the secret and the bare metal host. So we see the uh, new BMH getting registered and the transition state. They're uh, waiting for that. And meanwhile, I'll just go to the metal cube uh, machine template. So we have two, one for the control plane and the other one for the workers. I'll just edit the control uh, plane uh, one to add the uh, host uh, selector there. And this uh, will not trigger any action into uh, we uh, basically uh, delete the uh, machine then here uh, that can start selecting or basically based on the label, select the new or the selected uh, label or the BMH that is labeled. 
So I'm just adding a, a match label field here with pool uh, control plane to the uh, little cube machine template. Yeah, that has been done. Uh, nothing happening yet. So the inspection of the BMH will take few few minutes. So I'm gonna just uh, go forward and uh, skip that. Yeah. So yeah, now after like almost four minutes, uh, the BMH is ready. It's in the available state. So I will proceed with deleting one of the control plane machines. Yeah, it's uh, this one. You can see the machine started deleting and the BMH started deprovisioning from here. This also gonna take a few minutes. So I will uh, proceed with this to get the machine uh, deleted and the BMH uh, provisioned after a few, few minutes. So we have two uh, BMH now uh, available. And yeah, after that, automatically we get a new uh, machine uh, trying to get uh, provision. It's in the provisioning state, but uh, it's still waiting for the BMH with the label that we uh, selected in, in the beginning in the host uh, selected. So I will wait just uh, 30 seconds or so to show that it will not take any of the available BMH until we label the, the uh, BMH. Yeah, now I'm labeling the node 4 with the same uh, label that we use it for the host selector field. And yeah, after that, this uh, BMH got, uh, yeah, it, now it got selected and it will start uh, provisioning. Yeah, the provisioning will take also a few, few uh, minutes, but after that we can see the uh, BMH provisioned uh, yeah, here and the machine uh, after also a few minutes it will move to the running running phase. Yeah, this uh, here one of the basic features that we wanted to, to show. If you have uh, any comments. I, I, I just thank you moment for the demo. I just wanted to add that where, where this this was coming from, why we decided to show this. Uh, we were discussing it for quite some time and, and uh, for example, an upgrade use case when you upgrade the control plane, that that's quite common for for uh, Capi, CAPI providers. Uh, also, remediation is, is a quite common thing, like CAPI providers implement the remediation controllers. Those are similar scenarios. This is this was something a bit more, more um, bare metal specific and, and a bit more uh, nuanced. So this was like a real life use case when someone just bought new hardware, had a live physical cluster, a physical bare metal cluster running, serving customers on. And uh, they just wanted to swap out the machines without disturbing anything. And, and this was just a recent event that happened. And we thought that we would showcase that, um, that scenario because that's not that common with, with like a um, um, cloud provider or something that you have to Pull, pull out a server and, and put out, put in a new uh, hardware that you just bought. So that, that's where the idea came from to show this. And also this is not just the workers, but this was was like a control plane node replacement uh, for a, for a, um, this um, a live cluster. So that's why we thought this would be something that 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 is a nice demo. Thanks, Adam. Um, I got a question, if I may. Um, so, sorry if it's a bit basic, but like I'm trying to to understand how much coupling do you have here between um, the the cluster API 
and um, Kubernetes version to to the actual host. Like, if I want to upgrade each and one of them, how does it cascade? Uh, for so if if we talk about node, like what happened here, then then nothing changed. So because the the more finicky is is the Kubernetes version upgrade. Here, here it didn't happen. It just used the same version of of Kubernetes with the, basically the same node image. Uh, here in our case, it's the node images that are getting provisioned on the machine. So those are the key. Those have the new Kubernetes version and so on. So if you upgrade, we have to reprovision and write a new image to the disk. So in this scenario, th that was just uh, there. There were no dependencies basically. Uh, in, in an upgrade scenario, uh, we have uh, tests on. Uh, or even documentation that I don't remember from top of my head, but I, I think we follow the Capi, uh, Capi Kubernetes version upgrade uh, uh, guidelines and, and we integrate into that process. So, and, and again, others correct me if I'm wrong, but, but what Capi supports, what uh, Kubernetes upgrade they support between like from version to version, uh, we do the same. So the version, I don't know, I just say something like 1.7 of, of the CAPM3 supports a given version of CAPI and what Kubernetes upgrade that CAPI version supports, that, so that is the one that we support. So it, 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 we align it with the CAPI capabilities. Yeah, sometimes we also uh, confuse between upgrading the hardware, the bare metal host itself and, and the software on that are the image that we are provisioning. And the image, as you said, it's uh, whatever image you want to bring, right? Yeah, yeah, whatever image you want to bring. Uh, I have to clarify one thing. So when I was talking about the bare metal functionalities, the image doesn't matter. So if you just want to manage machines without Kubernetes, then you put whatever you want and, and, and that's it. If uh, you use the whole stack and want to build up the clusters, which is the like the more common use case, then of mm -hmm. course uh, it has to be some Linux distro at this point, some uh, x86 uh, Linux distro uh, at, at this point. Oh, so, and uh, ARM, ARM is not supported? So ARM is, it's not like the limitations for ARM is in the, in the Ironic and Linux Python agent. There is work to bring in uh, multi-architecture support there, mm -hmm. but uh, there are some, uh, some work to be done, but it, it's, it's an ongoing process. It's, we don't really, uh, uh, the discussions were not really about ARM, but in, in multi-architecture in, in, in general. Uh, and I, I, it might be that someone can already put together one, like, like try it out. We, we are not officially uh, testing that. So we are officially just testing with, with uh, x86 x at the moment. Cool. Ironic is the provisioning part, right? Yeah, I, Ironic is the the provision uh, the yeah the provision manager or the provisioner what we borrowed from the OpenStack community. And as I said, we have an additional agent, the Ironic Python agent that we also borrowed from there. So these two component. Uh, yeah, that 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 directly touches the physical machine. Well, thanks. That uh, that was a great presentation. Um, I personally don't have anything to add. How uh, about you, Stephen? Yeah, th thank you very much for the for the presentation, the demo. Um, it was a great demo. I think. Um, I think I am all good from my side as well. All right. So um, wish you all a great day. Yeah. Th um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, have a nice bye. day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.